Good morning, Sunnyside. It's good to see you. Merry Christmas. My name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I have the privilege of sharing in the message time with you this morning. But to get you started, I'm going to give you another activity if you haven't had enough of that already. And I'm going to do a quiz. So all of you Bible nerds who um, think you're pretty good, here's your chance. I'm going to give you a quiz. And just to let you know, the first person that I did uh, this quiz with was our, our, our student uh, pastor, Micah, who's with, at the hospital with his wife having, well, they already had their baby uh, with her, with, at the hospital this morning. Um, he scored 80%. And that's just a youth pastor. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's see who can get 100% on this quiz. It's all about um, obscure people in the Bible. So on your tables, there should be a folded piece of paper in half, unfolded, or on those tables up there. Grab one of those pieces of paper. It's under, maybe underneath that little uh, uh, deal you got there, that uh, cur- acrylic thing. Um, I want you to match these names, okay? If you're watching online, here it is. You can uh, match these names. Do the best you can. We'll give you just a couple minutes to do it. Let's see how good you are. Use all the resources you have, all right? Uh, just a hint. Use all the resources that you have. And you can say, go. Match the names. Got two minutes. Remember, use all the resources that you have. That includes your little phone, Siri, Alexa, whatever you got there. She might help you. If you're sitting at a table with somebody that uh, you don't know, make sure you introduce yourself somewhere along the line, all right? Some of you are just messing around. You're not even participating. Okay, time's up. How many, did anybody get them all? Do you think you got them all? Kara? I was in first service. You cheater, okay. (laughs) She's in first service, doesn't count. Anybody? Nobody got them all. How many got maybe eight out of ten? Ooh, you guys are really bad. Half of them. Anybody get half of them? These are really obscure names, aren't they? So you've never heard of some. Here's the key. Put the key up there for everybody if you want to check your answers to see how many you got right. Um, one, one, one group of people got them all right this morning in the first service, but uh, that's okay. You guys are, you can stay. You can stay, all right? The, the point of this is there's some obscure people in the, in the Bible, but guess what? They're in the Bible, right? God noticed them and God put them there for a reason. This, this Christmas season, we are doing a series of messages called Noticed, and it's about noticing people by noticing some of the lesser-known characters in the Christmas story. Here's the deal. We realize that everybody wants to be noticed. Even those of you who are right now saying to me in your mind, I don't need to be noticed. That's why I sit in the back row. I call you the back row folks, okay? And even the back row folks, if we're really honest with ourselves, we don't need accolades or maybe you don't need praise, but you need to be noticed. In one way or another, all of us need to have somebody take note of us because inside there's, there's and I think this is how God created us, a, a sense to be needed and to be appreciated. 
It shows up in the workplace. We know this, that um, one of the primary reasons employees quit is feeling underappreciated or not appreciated at all. Matter of fact, more people quit their jobs because they're not appreciated than over wages, that they're not making enough. There's a study from the organization called Office Team that looked to uncover this power of appreciation, if you will, and they found that 66% of employees would quit tomorrow if they didn't feel appreciated. And that number goes up if you talk about younger adults. Millennials would quit. Eight out of ten millennials would quit if they felt like they weren't appreciated where they worked. Ask yourself, would I stay where I'm at, working or the place where you spend the majority of your time, if you felt like you were not appreciated or nobody noticed what you did there at work? You know, the Christmas season, it is our deepest desire as a church to make sure that everybody comes in here, knows and realizes that when you feel like you might be underutilized, not valued, forgotten about, less than cared about, invisible, or maybe just plain unnoticed, that God notices you. I really, really want you to know that. We all want you to know that, that God sees you, He notices you right where you're at. Now, last week, Corey started this series off by a lesser-known Bible character in the Christmas story by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. Now, most of us have heard about John the Baptist, but we may struggle to name his father. But it was Zechariah and just how God noticed his pain. He and his wife, Elizabeth, didn't have any children. They were barren, and it went on like that for decades until they were in their old age before God performed a miracle, and they were able to conceive a child. And God noticed that pain. This week, we're going to notice another, perhaps even lesser-known Bible character, Simeon. Now, of all the plays that you've seen, the Christmas plays with the shepherds, and they come down the aisle, and the three wise men and all that, you probably didn't ever have a Simeon in your play. But he plays an important role in the Christmas story, and we're going to talk a little bit about Simeon today. And just to show you that God notices people like Simeon, He notices people like you and me, and He notices in particular not only our pain, but He notices our joy, okay? God notices our joy. And so the big idea for today is notice the joy. Can you say that with me? Notice the joy. One more time. Notice the joy. Now, you think that'd be a no-brainer during Christmas, right? <clears throat> Not so much anymore. I think that we are trained and we are taught right now to notice the negative in our world. Well, I want to change that this morning. And let me tell you the story of Simeon's joy. It's found in Luke chapter 2. And I want you to get your Bibles out, turn them on if you have them on your phone or whatever. Um, but we're going to look at that in just a minute. And Jesus, as a baby, is about a month and a half old. He's just 40 days old, uh, a month and a, and a week old, I should say. And according to the law in the Old Testament, at this time, uh, a child was to be taken to the temple, if it was a firstborn male, to be dedicated to the Lord. And the mother was to go through some purification rituals as well. And so Joseph and Mary were about to do this. They were on their way to the temple to offer some sacrifices on behalf of Jesus, just like the law said they should do, and uh, to present their son to the Lord. Now, they knew, obviously, they had this, this, you know, if you know the Christmas story, they had the visits from the angels and so forth. So they knew Jesus was different, right? It all happened in a miraculous way. And so they understood that, but still life was kind of being weird. It was, they were like trying to raise this normal kid. Um, things were kind of normal, but they weren't normal. So they didn't understand necessarily all what was going on. But um, they're at the temple performing this, you know, ritual or this ceremony that the Old Testament required. By the way, the closest thing we would have to that uh, today in today's world and time is a baby dedication. We do it every Mother's Day. We dedicate our children to the Lord. And basically what we're saying is the same thing they were saying then is that, Lord, this child is yours. We know that life comes from you, but thank you for granting us uh, the responsibility and the privilege of raising this child. We want to do it the way that you uh, prescribe to do so. So that's what a dedication or a commitment is um, in the um, Christmas story. Jesus is going through the same thing. And so as they're doing this, 
they're coming into the temple, if you will, just lots of people, kind of imagine just a lot of hubbub going on, maybe like a downtown scene during the parade or something, just a lot of stuff happening. And they, they bump into this guy named Simeon, all right? We know very little about him, only a few verses in Luke chapter 2. We don't know how old he was, if he was really old or really young. We have some guesses we can make from the context. Um, and, and the Bible just says that he was a righteous and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was a devout and righteous man. So he followed the Lord closely. He followed the law closely. We don't know if he was a priest or, like I said, we just don't know anything about him. And that's apparently not important to the story because God did not include that. But in, the, in addition to all that, it says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, that's significant to note because we know now on this side of the cross, if you will, in the New Testament time, in modern times, after Jesus, we all have access to the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit lives within us, okay? And, and we understand that, acknowledge that that wasn't true in the Old Testament. So for Simeon to have that, to have the presence of the Holy Spirit full time uh, was a unique situation. And the Holy Spirit led him and guided him and directed him. That's quite the resume, right? Holy, devout, righteous. And somewhere along the line, he was given this message, before you die, you will see the consolation of Israel. And we don't know if he got that when he was a child or if he got it just recently. Um, um, but he, he had this message from the Lord that he would not die until he see, see, has seen the consolation of Israel. Let's talk about that word just for a second because we need to understand what it means. Consolation means comfort. Seems fairly obvious to console someone, to make them feel better. And so this word was used to describe the coming Messiah in Israel. You can find it a couple places in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament. This, it, it, it's, it's almost a word that literally means the calling or the hope or the message like this, you're going to receive something that's going to, or you're going to receive someone that's going to be kind of like the message of peace that when, you, when your heart and your soul have been un unrest and disturbed and you kind of can take a deep breath and go, ah, now it's better because of a message you've received or information or, or circumstances have changed. Simeon had received, he said, you're going to get that. You're going to see the one that I'm sending to bring this hope to Israel, to end all of the unrest. You see, Israel, at the time of Simeon, when the Jesus was born, it was totally in chaos. Okay? They were controlled by the Romans. Um, the people weren't quite sure where they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to be doing. A prophet hadn't spoken for 400 years. That's, by the way, called the intertestamental period. The 400 years between Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, and when John the Baptist comes on the scene. It's 400 years. They don't, they don't hear anything from God. So there's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of questions. Has God left us? What, what's happening? The Romans are in, are in charge of our country. And things seem to be getting worse. Does any of that, by the way, sound familiar? Do we live in a time of unrest with lots of questions, wondering what's going on? Politically, this whole COVID thing, all this stuff is happening. We need some comfort. We need a consolation. Well, back, back to the story. So one day, the Spirit of God tells Simeon, go into the temple. See, some people think that maybe Simeon was a priest who was performing the, the act of dedication. Well, I'm not quite sure of that because it seems like he, it was just random that he, he wasn't on duty or anything. The Spirit led him into the temple and said, I want you to go to the temple. Whether he said that verbally, he spoke in words, or just kind of gave that nudging in his heart. He said, okay, well, Lord, I'm not sure why, but he goes in. And so perhaps it's like any normal day, any kind of day that's just, you know, um, wandering around the streets of Jerusalem. Maybe he was headed to the market and God gives him a detour and says, I want you to go into the temple. And so he goes into the temple wondering, what is God up to? Now remember, he had see received this message sometime in the past. We don't know if it was years ago, months ago, decades ago. But he knew that things were going to get better. And he was going to see the start of it. He was going to see the Messiah. He was going to see the consolation. He was going to see the hope. God promised him that and he believed it. 
And so he goes into the temple. If you can imagine, um, it's a busy place. There's lots of, lots of folks again there, maybe some other families doing the same thing that, that Joseph and Mary were there for. And then all of a sudden, Simeon looks across the room, maybe all the way from the back of this room to, the, to the, about where the doors are, and he sees this little family of mom and dad and a little baby. You ever see those photographs where it's just kind of zooming in on the subject and everything else is blurred out? I can imagine in my own mind that's what happened to Simeon. All the noise kind of just went away. He can't hear anything, can't see anything but that couple. And I wonder, I wonder if things started to click. This is what God was up to. He wants me to see that family. And as Simeon makes his way there, he, he notices more and more the child in Mary's arms. God, what are you up to? What, what's, the, the, what's this fam? Then it hits him. This is it. It's the consolation of Israel. It's the Messiah. That's who that is. Now, it might have been a little awkward you, you, if, you, if you think about it. Here's, let's just say he was an older gentleman, and he makes his way across the room, and, and Mary and Joseph got this brand-new little baby. He's the son of God. They, they remember all the stories from the angels and everything, and the shepherds and the magi, and they remember all of that, and they're, so they're protecting him really well. This, this weird little guy comes up and says, give me your baby. I, I don't think it was like that. I think Simeon just walked with an air of confidence and peace, and his face was probably glowing and Mary looked at him, and Mary, through all of the things that had happened, the Spirit of God was speaking to her, saying, it's okay. That's my man. And Mary just kind of relaxes. And maybe instinctively, I don't know, maybe Simeon didn't even have to ask, but maybe she just handed over the baby to Simeon. And he takes that little baby in his arms. And he knew. He knew. This was the Messiah. Have you ever had an experience even somewhat similar to that? Some long-awaited desire or longing comes out of the blue. Maybe you weren't even expecting it, and you go, whoa, Amazon finally made it to my door. You, know? you, 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 just, you, you just knew and that sense of comfort and consolation was just all through your body. Finally. Our family experienced that years ago. Our oldest daughter, her and her husband, were school teachers for the first part of their marriage. They went to Ghana, West Africa to teach in a school over there. And they had thought maybe they would start their family when they were over there. They weren't quite sure what was going to happen and so forth. But to make a long story short, they realized uh, not too far into their marriage that they couldn't get pregnant. They had some medical situations going on, and uh, they had tried for years and years and years to get pregnant. They, when they were in Ghana, West Africa, they worked at a school that was near an orphanage. They had to walk past this orphanage to get to work uh, at the school every day. Uh, and so they made friends with the orphanage. They did some work there. They fell in love with the kids. And they wrote and told us, we may bring some children home or a child home and get prepared. And so we were praying about that, if that was the case. But that was when Africa began really cracking down and making adoptions much more difficult, and rightly so, because it was too easy. And um, they, uh, you know, children were being trafficked. It was an awful mess. They've, they've changed a little bit of that and, and, and gotten a handle on some of that. But it made it very difficult. And the time frame that they were in, it wasn't possible for them to get an adoption. So they came home and continued to try to get pregnant and couldn't do it. And some of you in this room understand what that's like and what that feeling is like. And they tried and they tried. And um, I remember um, eight years into their marriage on Father's Day, Daisha, that's our daughter, telling us, we're pregnant. We're pregnant. And I remember that Father's Day. <sighs> Happy tears, right? Happy tears. Kieran, our, our grandson, was born or was announced to be born and was born nine months later. You know, when, when you experience something like that and you say, oh, it's time, you just know, right? You just know. And I can imagine Simeon, I just know the tears coming, the joy, the, 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 the final presentation of the Messiah is here. 
There's another story that I came across. Her name is Belle, Belle Barbu. She's 25 years old, grew up in an adopted home in Utah. But she knew she was different, and she knew she was adopted. Apparently, her family, that family was good to her. And she went on a search, though, for her biological family, just out of curiosity. And she discovered that she was from Romania. This organization, through DNA and other situations, helped her find her family, narrowed it back to Romania, even down to the village she was born in, even to her biological family who were still there. And this organization orchestrated a reunion. She volunteered and said, I'd really like to meet my biological family. Can you imagine being 25 years old, knowing that you had a family out there somewhere, but not even having any idea or any clue where they were in the world? You see, part of the story is her family loved her very much and wanted to keep her, but she was kidnapped as a newborn. The hospital was in cahoots with this orphanage, and they were stealing babies from people, putting them in the orphanage, and then the orphanage was selling them on the market, on the black market. And that's what happened to her. You see, the hospital told her parents, your baby is very sick, and she's got to stay here in the hospital. You go home, and we'll let you know when she gets better. They called her and said, your baby died. So for 25 years, the family thought Belle was dead. They contacted the family, contacted Belle. They got them together. I want to show you the video of the reunion, not the whole video, but just a couple of minutes of Belle and her family being reunited. Watch this. 15 minutes away from meeting your long lost family. How do you feel? I can't imagine what that was like. I can't imagine the, the feelings and the emotions. They're just they're beyond, they're beyond words, right, um, of having that kind of longing fulfilled. Um, when Simeon experienced that, it was magnified that times a hundred, times a thousand of what he was experiencing. But now, things were different. There's a painting by a modern artist by the name of Ron Diciani, and uh, I'm not an artist, so I always appreciate good art and clever art especially. Um, and this picture is one of my favorites of Simeon holding the baby Jesus. And he's, the artist, uh, Diciani, said, I, I, I wanted his face to, to tell the story. And it's one of ecstasy, one of joy, one of unexplained words of I finally get the whole Jesus. The light showing the light of the world as Jesus is called. The map saying that um, Jesus came for all the world, not just for the Jewish people, but he came for everybody, and that's what that symbolizes. And that all started when Simeon got to see the baby. And now Simeon's wait is over. He could go and die in peace, he tells God. God had noticed this obscure man of righteousness and devoutness, And I don't know about you, but I kind of think that in that scene, God was looking down and crying and laughing and and hollering with Simeon, noticing his joy. Because Simeon had, he had to have heartache. Their beloved Israel was under the iron boot of Rome. Things weren't the way they were supposed to be. The teachers of the day were a bunch of hypocrites. They were whitewashed tombs, as Jesus called them. People were generally, as a population, apathetic and wandering around, as Jesus called them, like sheep without a shepherd. That's the world that Simeon lived in. It was kind of a mess. And that's when the consolation came. That's when the Messiah came. 
But here Simeon was walking around with this smile on his face. Don't you love those people? No matter what the circumstances are, they got this little silly grin on. And it's the grin that says, I know something you don't know. I'm going to see the Messiah. He's coming to fix all this before I die. It's soon, people. Simeon was the embodiment of the scripture found in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. It says, rejoice in hope. It doesn't say rejoice in your circumstances because they can be a mess. He says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. Simeon was that guy. He taught us what that means. And I want you to, to know this morning, all of you, that your long-awaited desires, your longings, your hopes, and your dreams... They are in the mind of God as well as in yours. Do you ever have a hard time telling your hopes and dreams to somebody? Maybe they're even difficult to tell your spouse or your closest friend. But there is a sense that you need to know that God knows exactly what you're feeling and longing for. He knows exactly. And he knows also that for many of you, it's been a long time already for that to be fulfilled. Are you with me? There's some of you that are here that are saying to me or saying to yourself right now, yeah, Eric, I get it, and it's been a long time, and it's still not yet fulfilled. To you, I say that God understands that as well. He wrote Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but the desire fulfilled is the tree of life. So he understands this tension that we go through. And when you're joyful, God notices God celebrates with you. And God wants you to know that he sees you right now. I want to jump to the story in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 28 through 32. This is basically Simeon's response to all this. When this started to happen and um, Simeon knew what was going on, and it all came clear to him. Listen to what he says. And he, he took him in his arms. He took the baby Jesus in his arms. And he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. So what he's saying there is, I can go die now. Because what you said, your word, what you said was going to happen has happened. Finally, it has happened. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people. He, did, he wasn't quite sure how this whole Jesus thing was going to work out. He just knew Jesus was going to do it. This little baby was going to do it. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for your glory to your people Israel. So all peoples, that's, that's the whole map thing on that picture. For everybody, including Israel. So... Mary and Joseph, if you read on the story, can't believe what's happening. This is just another great story in the life of the parents trying to raise the Son of God. Simon blesses them, and that's it. No more Simon in the Bible. We don't know what happened to him. He could have died that afternoon, you know, and said, take me now, Lord, I'm done. Could have died, you know, 33 years later after Jesus was crucified. He could have witnessed that. We don't know. But he got to see the Messiah. And all we know is that on that day, God and Simeon had a great moment of joy together. And that's all Simeon needed. You know, when we take a look at the life of Jesus, we can't help but see how he was the master of noticing the unnoticed. In one parable that Jesus called those people the least of these. I love the story that Jesus healing a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And Jesus was her last hope. I was actually in the area when I was visiting Israel a couple of years ago where this happened. And you can imagine all the crowds being around Jesus. It was a very busy time in his ministry. And people were crushing in on him, trying to get close to him. He's on his way to perform a healing. The apostles or the 12 disciples are kind of acting like an entourage or a bunch of bodyguards. And they're saying, excuse us, pardon us, excuse us, pardon us. Uh, master, this way, come on. You're like they were escorting a celebrity or something. And Jesus is walking down the road, and all of a sudden, he stops. And the disciples are going, come on, we got places to go, people to heal, ministry to perform. And he says, somebody touched me. And the, one of the disciples goes, well, of course, duh. Look at all this crowd, people. There's lots of people touching you. No, no, no. 
Somebody touched me. I felt the power go from me. And this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years just wanted to get close. She did not even ask to be noticed. I don't care if he notices me. I just want to touch him. But Jesus noticed. Jesus noticed. He stopped and said, I felt someone who was it. And this woman who did not care to be noticed, just to be in proximity of the master, came close and he said, I imagine the buzz is still going on. People are saying, come on, Jesus, we got to go. And there's still people talking and so forth. But you remember that picture of just everything else is a blur. The noise and this is gone. This woman looks at his eyes and he says to her in Luke chapter 8, verse 8, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And I imagine there's a big old smile on Jesus' face. And amongst every, all the chaos, he just winks at her. Says, you're good. Can you imagine being noticed? This, we, don't, we don't know that lady's name. We don't know anything about her. We're going to talk to her in heaven too. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, it says that we are to be happy with those who are happy. To be sad with those who are sad, but to be happy with those who are happy. Don't be that person that is waiting for the story to end that you're listening to just for them to take a breath so you can one-up them on your story of joy. Stop and take the time to notice the joy of somebody else. People need to share good things in their life. And today, as I said earlier, we are in a time where we are trained and focused on the negative. I got to find out. The first thing I got to find out about you is whose side you're on. Okay? I don't think that's the way of the master. The way of the master is just to notice people for who they are. There's a strong connection between people when you celebrate together, by the way. Celebrate victories, positive events, and the opposite is unhealthy, actually. To always be focused on the negative and what's wrong. The big idea again today, notice the joy. Who can you find that has something good going on in their life? Everybody has something good going on in their life. Even though there are days, and I've said it, this is terrible. And I feel like Eeyore, oh, bother. Okay. Nothing's good. And I need somebody to come into my life and say, no, 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 no. You know, Jeremiah was a prophet in the Old Testament that wrote a, a big book about all the terrible things that was happening to Israel because of their sin. Jeremiah is kind of a dark and gloomy prophet. He's called the weeping prophet, actually. He's always crying because things are so bad. And they were. They were horrible. And he was the guy that had to go tell all the bad news. There was a contemporary of his day, by the, a, a lesser-known, unnoticed little prophet by the name of Zephaniah. He only had three chapters in his book wrote about the same stuff during the same time. But in his three little chapters, he writes about, it's going to get better. Jeremiah is going around crying all the time. Zephaniah is going around with that silly grin that Z Simeon had. Oh, it's bad. It's bad. But it's going to get good. And in chapter 3, verse 17 of his book, he says, For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. This is amidst a terrible, terrible time in Israel's history. He's saying these things. And finally, he says, he will rejoice over you with joyful songs. That's God leaning over you, looking at you, and singing with you. As a matter of fact, some translators say this phrase, rejoice over you, could also mean he will dance over you. Can you imagine God doing a dance for you? Wow. Because he's so happy for you. For whatever reason, I grew up imagining that God was an authoritative judge. That he was large and in charge. A good God, but somewhat distant. You know, he's just kind of, I just have to keep my distance from him. Maybe that's the way I viewed my dad or something. I don't know. But I, I know that just how I, I, I pictured God. Not a close, intimate relationship. And I believe that even through my teenage years, kind of my rebellious times and so forth, but then something happened. I, at age 17, I began to seek the Lord in a new and different way. And I went to a youth conference um, up in Denver. I was 17. And I went to this conference, and the speaker was speaking from 1 John. Um, and he talked about a God I was not familiar with, about a God of love, God who knows me personally, intimately. 
every detail about me, even my sin, but still loves me. Certainly not not the kind of God who sits on on a throne just issuing edicts and commands, but a God who personally has a relationship with me. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, I was contemplating this verse and contemplating all the things that this guy had said about 1 John. I lost complete track of time. I looked up and there was nobody left in the auditorium. Literally, I looked up and they were gone. And I thought, is this the rapture thing they've been talking about? What happened? The speaker was still there. He came over and asked me if I was troubled. And I said, no, I just got lots of questions. And he and I sat and talked for a long time after that. My own youth group left me. And I stayed there and talked to him about 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 that says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I said, only a personal God, only a loving God, only a God that knows me personally can do that. Not some judge with a gavel waving around his commands in an impersonal way. And it changed my life forever. To see God like that, a God that notices me. As a child of God, as a human being created in the image of God, you are created with the capacity to notice people as well. God wants us to be like his son Jesus. He gave us an example. When Jesus noticed people, he said, now I want you to go notice people. So let me issue a challenge. Whose joy will you notice in the next few weeks in the Christmas season? That person at work that no one else seems to take an interest in? Maybe they have something to celebrate that they're just, they don't have anybody to tell it to. Maybe the wait staff at the restaurant where you go this afternoon after church is over, who most people treat just like a machine, get my order. My wife and I made the practice of getting to know wait staff at, wait, at restaurants, and I can't tell you the number of times we've cried with people who've not anybody ever asked them, no, really, seriously, how's your day? I don't mean that just as a greeting. I mean that as a real question. You seem troubled. What's going on? The odd family member that no one else in your family wants to be around but has something to celebrate. Will you take the time to do that? The person who sits alone in church the nameless neighbor that everybody else kinds of shuns, the kid at school that sits alone at lunch or walks to and from school alone, will somebody notice them? There are thousands that go unnoticed every day in this world. As believers in Christ, we are to be the ones who notice them, who make a difference in somebody's life. I I could go into story after story of just how a moment has changed the trajectory of somebody's life. Some of you may be in here. It was a teacher. It was a coach. It was a family member. It was a friend. You never underestimate the power of noticing those who don't get noticed. I hope you don't forget who Simeon was. I hope you desire to meet him someday in heaven too. Say, oh, you're that guy. And then all the other people that now you see with the eyes of Christ who don't get noticed. Notice the joy. Let me pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you noticed us, that when we were not even paying any attention to you, we were lost and we were selfish and wandering around just looking out for our own interests. But teach us, Father, to be like you, to notice the unnoticed, whether it's a short little tax collector named Zacchaeus hiding in a tree that nobody else cares about or a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, or a leper who people want to unnotice more than notice. Teach us to be like you, to notice those people, to notice their joy, their heartaches, their pain, and their joy. Thank you, Father, and thank you for the ability to do this. We pray that your Spirit would lead us where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.